Hello, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with RealityShifters.com talking with you today about quantum jumping from the peripheries of our mind. And this whole topic came up when I was interviewed recently by Brian McFarlane on his YouTube channel. It was a hangout with um, some other good folks talking about the Mandela Effect. And he prepared a beautiful question for me to contemplate and discuss on the live stream chat. And this, this idea was just, what do you mean, Cynthia, when he'd heard me talk about that before, that quantum jumping occurs in the peripheries of our mind? You know, what exactly does that entail? <laughs> What's that all about? What does it look like? How does it work? All that good stuff. So to dive into that, I want to really start with a tour of some related areas, starting with the shyness effect. That's a, t a term that was coined in 1975 by a physicist named John Taylor. He wrote a book about, um, about all of these different phenomena and sort of the science of metaphysics, if you will. And I do have links to these uh, resources and references in the blog that's uh, connected to the video for this. And basically the shyness effect is the observation, and it's the interesting observation, that's usually, quite often, when scientists or researchers are doing their best to catch something in the act in other words, Uri Geller's famous spoon bending. Um, and I met Uri Geller in October 1999 in San Francisco. He did bend a spoon from my house and sprouted seeds in the palm of his hand. And was also able to demonstrate some psychic phenomena, including telepathy. And in the midst of all of those demonstrations, an amazing experience occurred where he was specifically asking one volunteer to send him a color. And he was, Yuri was doing his best to tune in and get that color. But then he remarked to the whole group of us who were there, I think I'm getting some interference. Is there anybody, and he challenged the audience, the, the, those of us who were supposed to be observing, but not sending. He said, is someone else sending a color? And a gentleman in the back of the room raised his hand and said, I was. And Yuri said, that's just creating some chaos here. A little bit of, um, clutter, you know, cluttered thoughts, conflict in being able to, for him to pick up the correct color that was being broadcast. And so I'm bringing that little demonstration up because it also reminded me of my own experience with the shyness effect. When I was a young girl of about five years old, it was, it was the mid 1960s. And I was in the living room of my house, looking out these beautiful windows to the backyard, watching the rain gently fall. And I would think, stop rain and it would stop and i think start rain and it would start i did this back and forth just a beautiful meditation and it was very relaxing and soothing and then i realized i'd like to share this with my mom so i was about five years old i ran from the living room to her bedroom where she was and there was a window there too and i invited her to watch with me i said mom mom watch this and i guess i should have noticed once i told her what i was doing um, that she was not at that point feeling open-minded for whatever reason. So she crossed her arms and looked kind of, you know, like a parent would do, like they're, they're humoring the child, but it's a stretch of the imagination to believe that rain is going to start and stop when you say to do that. And sure enough, it didn't work. <laughs> so it's very similar to what happened to Uri Geller in 1999 in San Francisco, where he'd asked one volunteer to send a color. Unbeknownst to Uri at first, there was someone else sending a different color. And that's what I witnessed with two of us looking at the rain. And if we're not both seriously in a coordinated, coherent fashion, agreeing that we're both starting and stopping the rain, we're going to witness something else, which we did. So this is, um, in my opinion, this is very related to shyness effect, which is the phenomenon where most of these mind-matter interactions do not occur um, typically exactly so we can see them, hear them, measure them, what have you. Usually, it's more likely to occur just to the periphery of our attentional focus. And there, I believe there's a reason for that. But before I get into that, I will talk first about how our minds are, I think they're just as good, if not better, than quantum computers. And why do I say better? Because we're already noticing, um, as I mentioned in my book, Quantum Jumps, that many of the quantum phenomena that were considered originally to be 
too unlikely for us ever to observe in the warm, wet, noisy biological environments of living plants and animals? Well, guess what? As I mentioned in my book, Quantum Jumps, we are noticing it. The first one that seems to be completely verified is photosynthesis in plants. Absolutely looks like a macroscopic quantum phenomena occurring when a photon hits the leaf of a plant then it basically that the delivery system by which a plant takes the energy from that photon and delivers it to a storage area it's like solving the the, the craziest traffic problems in one of the busiest cities in the world at rush hour because that's what the plant is doing it's basically finding somehow the best solution which is a quantum process it's a quantum random walk from one moment where that first photon hits a leaf to where that photon energy needs to go. And it was, it's been proven mathematically by Seth Lloyd at MIT, who was skeptical. He, he, he just wanted to investigate it because he'd heard um, outrageous claims. And you've heard that when there are, you know, remarkable claims, then you need remarkable evidence and you need something quite serious. And that's what Seth Lloyd was able to um, unexpectedly produce, mathematically showing that the quantum walk, the quantum random walk model is exactly what plants are doing. And I expect we'll see more of these things, as I mentioned in my book, Quantum Jumps, an extraordinary science of happiness and prosperity. That's the name of the book. Um, and in that book, I also mentioned lots of other research, including into bird aviation and location, their um, bird's ability to uh, determine where they are is absolutely looking like it's another quantum process. And the way that we smell with our noses, it looks like we're using quantum teleportation uh, within our noses to be able to pick up a fragrance that's basically making a jump across sort of a, a bridge, a barrier that we wouldn't expect it to be doing. Probably we'll see lots more evidence in the future. I'm expecting it. Um, so anyway, now that we know that we can do that and these quantum processes are ba basically what our mind is doing, another thing to be aware of is that our minds are operating with the way we make decisions and the way we use our mind for cognition. That is definitely looking quantum as well. I talked with scientist Dr. Jerome Busemeyer about this topic and he is one of the co-authors of a book on this topic, um, Quantum Models of Cognition and Decision Making. And basically, it's brilliant. The book is brilliant. It does have some math in it, but it's written for the layperson to read. You can just skip the equations and read the rest of it. And then you can see some of the brilliant um, research that's showing that clearly our minds are operating already across a very entangled cosmos that we have connections that are pre-existing that basically allow us to make leaps of intuition, leaps of insight, leaps of awareness. And I predict we're going to see more and more of that evidence as well going forward that we clearly are thinking in quantum ways. So I told you I'd get to the juicy part about what's going on with um, these pr quantum jumping in the peripheries. What's the key to the whole thing? It is a particular quantum process that I want to highlight called the quantum Zeno effect. And I have spoken about it previously in other videos on occasion. And this time, I just want to start by describing what is that quantum Zeno effect. Uh, it comes from very ancient um, story and ancient philosopher's perspective that you can break down. Uh, you can make a journey infinite if you just keep taking every step that you're taking to get to your destination and cutting it in half. It's kind of like you keep moving forward, but you're getting slower and slower <laughs> until it just like seems like you get nowhere. So that's the kind of Zeno um, proposition from philosophy from uh, really hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. And then more recently, uh, Alan Turing proposed the idea that it might be possible to use this quantum Zeno effect within quantum systems. So he really gets the credit for that. Uh, more recently, in the last 10 years, we've had lots of experiments conclusively showing that you can absolutely lock a quantum system in place. Now, what is a quantum system? Using my fingers, like one quantum particle is represented by one finger. A quantum system is all these quantum entangled particles sort of dancing around in quantum <laughs> soup, if you will. But they're entangled. They're moving together like a flock of birds. So to lock that system in place, all it takes is an observer, such as myself, to watch that system 
and just lock it in place. We've heard of watched pot never boils. One of the first times I mentioned this phenomenon, I was using examples from Doctor Who, <laughs> because there's an episode of Doctor Who that does this, and the idea of the watched pot never boils. I've been using that example for years to describe the phenomenon, because most of us have heard when we're growing up, don't just stare at the water boiling. It's not going to go any faster if you stare at it. In fact, it may seem like it takes forever. Now there's a quantum, um, basically a quantum premise in place, a quantum science, science behind that old wives' tale or um, folk tale. It's not just a folk tale. It turns out to be true. You can lock a quantum system in place by just observing, 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 relentlessly, continuously. So you don't stop observing, and that system can't budge as long as you keep observing, observing, observing it. It's like holding it in place. In order for that system to move, you need to actually look away. And we hear advice when we're learning to ride bicycles or motorcycles, don't look at the pothole. Now, why would an instructor say that? Uh, basically, because if you're looking at the pothole, uh, for some reason, we're just magnetically attracted to it, and we head right into it, even if you're trying to steer clear of it. Instead, the advice is to look at the horizon, to look to the destination, look toward where you are intending to go, rather than at the pothole, the big hole in the road coming up. And that way, you'll be headed safely on your way to your destination without hitting any potholes, pretty much. At least it's a lot less likely. So that's, I'm just bringing it up so you can think of real life examples when you know, the watch pot is not boiling and you're not gonna hit the pothole if you're looking at the horizon. So you really wanna fix your attention on the things you're grateful for, the things you care about, the things you love, the experiences you'd most wish to have. And that's where you wanna keep, when you are looking, that's where you're looking. When you're not looking, you leave it alone. And you give it this shyness opportunity to make a jump to a quantum state, to another possible reality, when you're not fixing your focal attention on it. So peripheral vision is the sides. I'm wiggling my fingers where I can sort of still see them, just behind my ears, kind of. And the focus directly ahead of us is where we put our primary attentional focus. And this has a big, um, has a lot to do with the way consciousness plays a role in quantum phenomena and in mind-matter interaction in our lives. So putting this all together, what we can do is recognize we need to do a little bit of both, focusing on what we love, what we desire, and then when we're not focusing, uh, and make sure that's what we're focusing on, not the potholes of life, but the destination, the goal, the, the golden age, the how good can it get, the how much we care about and revere and respect our planet Earth and the plants and animals and one another. You know, that's what to focus on. And then when we're not focusing, allow for that shyness effect and just have faith that when you're not looking, that's when the magic happens. Um, and the, I've seen that happen when I had a spoon bending party at my house. The, my daughter was able to bend her fork when she was just meditating and looking out the window, just feeling relaxed. And she said then it's like the, the fork just got soft and sort of melted over the shape of her arm. And something similar happened to me when I was once um, in a hurry to go catch a train on our local underground public transportation system called BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit. Anyway, I was holding a quarter, one of many coins I was putting in a slot. And when I got to that quarter, it got kind of warm like melted chocolate. And it just sort of um, bent just enough so that it would no longer go through that coin slot. Because now it was sort of this sort of mushy, soft thing. <laughs> it was so frustrating. Um, and it bent when I was trying to put it in the slot, so I thought, this is not working. I had to run back and get another coin, um, which turned out to be a good thing in that particular instance because I then caught the next train, not the one that I meant to catch, but this following train that came through next. And seated on that train was a person I never would have met otherwise who was reading a copy of a book by Edgar Mitchell, who was the founder of Institute of Noetic Sciences. They were giving the talk I was about to hear. And I was able to talk to this gentleman about a research project he was designing and developing to work with plant consciousness at the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Petaluma. It all started for me with the coin that just bent. And obviously there are higher orders of consciousness orchestrating things. So when we ask how good can it get, we're, in my case, I'm giving it to a higher level of consciousness. So 
there will be synchronicity that I didn't in consciously intend, but because I'm allowing for it by asking, how good can it get? How good can I get? And if you believe in God, how God can I get? How God can it get? And then we're really bringing the highest level of order into even tremendous chaos we may be experiencing at any given time. And so to wrap it all up again, what we're doing with the periphery quantum jumping is allowing for these things, for um, shyness to happen. You know, the shyness effect to take place. Um, when I'm missing something that I need, um, I'll often just close the cupboard. If it was something in the cupboard, walk away, come back, walk away, come back. I'll just check maybe four or five times until it shows up. So these are ways you can use this process. Um, and it works in pretty much any level of reality that you might think of. So have fun with it. And until next time, keep asking my favorite question, which is how good can it get? And look forward to hearing any of your experiences with that if you'd like to leave them in the comments.